Good morning. We are continuing through this book of Judges. We're plodding along and we are moving towards the end. I think we've got about uh, four weeks, I think, left. Um, You'll never get bored in a sermon on Judges, right? There's always something uh, new and exciting and uh, challenging to read, let alone talk about. Um, Last week, we finished Judges 11. We talked about a man named Jephthah. He judged Israel. He was a a man that uh, was a man of... uh, uh, I don't even know how to describe it. He was a he was a godly man. He knew God's word. He he uh, believed God. He's included in that uh, chapter, Hebrews eleven, of the heroes of the faith, our great cloud of witnesses. Um, he defeated the Ammonite oppressors. Uh, before doing so, he made his foolish vow. That's what he's most known for. Uh, a vow where he said, whatever comes out of my house to greet me, that I will offer up to the Lord. And uh, when he gets home, his daughter is the one who greets him. Uh, and the text just tells us, you know, uh, he does with her what uh, to fulfill his vow. And you can debate whether or not he actually literally sacrificed her or if he offered her up to the temple for service. Uh, but now to the end of his story, the man Jephthah. Uh, Jephthah. Uh, Judges chapter 12 is going to give us the conclusion of his story, uh, and then we're going to look at three judges, and then we're going to jump into a character that everybody is familiar with. If you have your copy of God's Word, then let's stand. I'll read Judges chapter 12, verses 1 through 7, and then we'll uh, pray, and we'll dive into this, and we'll go through the rest of the text as we go. Starting at verse 1 in Judges chapter 12, it says, The men of Ephraim were called to arms, and they crossed to... uh, Zaphon, Zaphon, and said to Jephthah, Why did you cross over to fight against the Ammonites and did not call us to go with you? We will burn your house over you with fire. And Jephthah said to them, I and my people had a great dispute with the Ammonites, and when I called you, you did not save me from their hand. And when I saw that you would not save me, I took my life into my hands and crossed over against the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into my hand. Why then have you come up to me this day to fight against me? Then Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead struck Ephraim because they said, You are fugitives of Ephraim, you Gileadites, in the midst of Ephraim and Manasseh. And the Gileadites captured the fords of the Jordan against Ephraimites. Uh, And when any of the fugitives of Ephraim said, Let me go over, the men of Gilead said to him, Are you an Ephraimite? When he said, no, they said to him, then say, Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth, for he could not pronounce it right. Then they seized him and slaughtered him at the fords of the Jordan. And at that time, 42,000 the Ephraimites fell. Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then Jephthah the Gileadite died and was buried in his city in Gilead. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time as we gather together. Would you speak to us this morning? Would you enlighten us, Holy Spirit, with your truth? Father, it is your word, and it's your word that we need to hear. And Father, I pray that you would speak through me this morning and bless your people, bringing glory and honor to your name, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Text starts with the men of Ephraim. It says they were called to arms, they crossed over, uh, they, they have a complaint against Jephthah. Uh, so they come to Jephthah and they say, hey, why'd you leave us out? You know, you went and fought against the Ammonites uh, and you left us out and they threatened him. Uh, hey, we're, gonna, we're here, we're going to burn down your house with you in it. They're nice guys, okay? Uh, so they, they, they come and, and how do you even respond to something like that, you know? You left us out, so we're going to burn your house down. They had uh, FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. Uh, They they apparently, uh, this is a routine for them. It is a recurring theme for this tribe of Ephraim. If you remember back to Judges chapter 8, they did the same thing to Gideon. They're mad that he didn't include them. Here's what's going on. They want credit, but not to actually do the work. 
They want the, the glory of what is going on. And there is a tendency in us, right, to want and desire credit for something, but to not have to do the work. I, I know I've shared this illustration before uh, of one time when my wife was away, I folded the laundry and I had this moment of internal conflict. Do I put it away and risk her not noticing it? Or do I leave it out folded so she knows I did something for her? You know, that's our tendency of the human heart, right? And the question we ought to be asking is, are we willing to do something that the Lord asks us, even if we don't receive any credit for it? Are we willing to clean toilets in the church, even if nobody notices it? And by the way, that's a false statement because God will notice. We're promised in his word in Hebrews chapter uh, 4. First of all, he says that the, uh, everything is laid bare before him who sees all things. We'll have to give an account for that. And later in chapter 6, he says God is not unjust to, 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 to not notice and to reward those. Um, uh, for God is not unjust to, so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name and serving the saints as you still do. God notices. So there's nothing that you do do, small or large, that God does not notice. And so we should never have our motive be, will somebody see it? These guys are insecure. They are envious. Pride and envy oftentimes go hand in hand. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's often manifested in anger and violence. James tells us, you know, why are there quarrels among you? It's because you have some, you, there's something you're envious for. There's something that you want that you don't have, and it causes fights you desire. In a more passive aggressive way, this is shown in, 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 in forms of, of criticism, right? Well, Jephthah, it tells us here that he doesn't treat the, uh, the Ephraimites like uh, Gideon did. Gideon, if you remember back in chapter 8, he used words and smoothed things over. Uh, with the Ephraimites, Jephthah, not so much. He's not in the mood, okay? He has fought an incredible battle. He's probably got some battle fatigue. He has just said goodbye to his daughter, whatever that looks like for the rest of, of her life uh, and his life. And, and so he, he's tired. And, 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 and listen, here's what he says. He says, listen, I and my people had a great dispute with the Ammonites, and when I called you, you did not save me from their hand. He says, listen, I called you, I needed you, and you didn't come. I put, so he says, I put my life, I took my life in my hand and crossed over against the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into my hand. Uh, he says, listen, I put my hand, I put my own life at risk and fought the Ammonites and God gave us the victory. So if you want to be upset with somebody for not including you, start with yourself, and then you can go talk to God because he didn't, uh, he's the one that gave the victory, and he's the one that worked out all the details. And then he says, so why are you mad at me? Why then have you come to me this day to fight against me? So Jephthah, he, he has no time for this. It tells us that uh, he gathered all the men of Gilead. He, he goes out and he fights against them. Uh, it doesn't sound like it's much of a battle. Uh, they, they capture the, the, the crossings, the fords of the Jordan. So if you looked at a map, you would see that Ephraim is on the, on the west side of the Jordan and, and Gilead, where they're at, is, is on the east side. And so they crossed over the Ephraimites to, to fight against them and, and the Ephraimites... Uh, are destroyed, they're, they're defeated, and, and, and the, the Gileadites capture the places where they would go to cross back over. And, and, and there is no crossing for these Ephraimites. It says the fugitives of Ephraim, they can't cross back over into their land without crossing past the Gileadites. And they come up with this test. It is a litmus test. It is a way to weed out the Ephraimites that tried to sneak over. Fascinating enough, uh, Shibboleth is actually come into modern English. It is used as it is. It is a term used to define a test to distinguish people. Uh, you can actually look it up in Webster's Dictionary. Uh, but here's what they did. They, they, they came to the fords, and everyone who was crossing over, they'd ask them, are you an Ephraimite? And, and they'd be like, no, no, I didn't come over to threaten to burn Jephthah's house down with him in it. I'm just your average Gileadite traveling back across into Ephraim. And they'd say, well, fine. If you are so, as you say, say the word shibboleth. And they would say, 
because they couldn't pronounce the sh sound, they'd say sibboleth. And I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it right, but it doesn't matter. Uh, so it, the word there, it just means stream. And they would try and say it, and it was a dead giveaway. Literally, if they didn't say it right, they were dead. Uh, that's how it worked. Uh, and, and, you know, it's just like any regional giveaway that we have today. Um, you can look at a whole host of examples. You know, if you ask, you know, what is the last meal of the day? Some people will say dinner. Some people will say supper. I have a conclusive answer for that. It's obviously supper because we don't celebrate the Lord's dinner. We celebrate the Lord's supper. Uh, you know, you, you might ask somebody, what do you call that carbonated, carbonated beverage that people drink? Soda, or was it pop? You know, and then you can even take it to just the pronunciation. What, how do you pronounce that white liquid that comes from a cow? Some will say milk, some will say milk. I don't even know how they pronounce it incorrectly, but that's what's going on. It's going on. Listen, there are two fascinating analogies that, that can be made here for application uh, that, that are a side note. Uh, one is how you talk can distinguish your relationship with the Lord. Jesus says to the Pharisees, listen, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? Uh, people talk about what they love. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Your relationship with the Lord can be visibly distinguished by people based on what you talk about. You can, you can find people that all they want to talk about is the things of this world. And, and then they'll show up at church. Maybe they're swearing up and down, left and right. And then they show up at church and all of a sudden they're clean and, and, and they talk very distinctly, very differently. Or, 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 you know, you know those people too that you can tell they have a deep abiding relationship with the Lord because that's all they want to talk about. They want to talk about Jesus. That, that, could be, that, that should be something to at least think about and process. There's a second application as well. At the same time, we can be thankful that our salvation is not based upon our spoken theology being perfect, right? It is based on the blood of Jesus by grace through faith in a relationship with Jesus Christ who has paid the price for us. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that theology isn't important because it is, but our reality is that when we get to heaven, it's not going to be that somebody's standing at the gate saying, say this, and if you say it wrong, you're out. There's a reality that it is about Jesus Christ. Uh, so there are some fascinating analogies here, but the, the back to the story, Jephthah tells us his army kills 42,000 of the Ephraimites. It is a bloody uh, civil war. The Ephraimites talked big, but they fought pathetic. Wiped out. And it all started because of jealousy, envy, instead of rejoicing that God was victorious. Listen, how tragic is it when churches treat other churches like competition? We are all one church working together for the glory of God. And yet there are times where somebody gets envious and, and you know, I don't want to hear about the success of that church. And, and oftentimes there's criticism and slander and gossip. Well, they did it wrong or whatever it looks like. The cause that they, they, they the results of that oftentimes is great damage in the face of the unbelieving world. It tells us at the end here that Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then Jephthah the Gileadite died and was buried in his city in Gilead. He judges for six years. He, if you remember, he is a man born to disadvantage. He becomes a national hero, uh, leaves no heritage. His only daughter uh, offered up to the Lord, mourns her virginity. So there's no children. There's no heritage. There's no uh, little Jephthah. Uh, and then it just ends with, in, in, in the original language, it's literally he was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. So we don't even know where he's buried. Now, we're going to contrast that here with three judges at the end of chapter 12. Uh, it says, after him, Ibazan of Bethlehem judged Israel. He had 30 sons and 30 daughters. He gave in marriage uh, outside his clan and 30 daughters he brought in from outside for his sons. And he judged Israel seven years. Then Ibazan died and was buried at Bethlehem. Verse 11, then, after him, Elon, not Musk, the Zebulonite judged Israel, and he judged Israel uh, ten years. Then Elon, the Zebulonite, died and was buried at Ijalon in the land of Zebulun. 
And then after him, Abaddon, the son of Hillel, the Pirathonite. I practiced that, dang it. Judged Israel, he had 40 sons and 30 grandsons who rode in, on 70 donkeys, and he judged Israel eight years. Then Abaddon, the son of Hillel, the Pirathonite, died and was buried at Pirathon in the land of Ephraim in the hill country of the Amalekites. So here's what's going on. Three relatively obscure judges. These are all judges in the north, okay? Uh, you say, well, what about Bethlehem? This isn't Bethlehem that Jesus was born in. This is Bethlehem in Zebulon. Joshua 19, verse 15 tells us this. Uh, it is a different, uh, uh, it is in the northern part of Israel. Uh, 30 sons, it tells us. He has 30 sons, 30 daughters. That's 60 kids. Uh, sent them out to find spouses from outside. So that's 120. Can you imagine the insanity of that family reunion? Uh, he, he sends them out. This is probably what's going on here is you probably have uh, the traditional formation of, uh, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of, uh, alliances through marriage. Uh, it tells us he judged Israel seven years, then he dies, and then we have Elon, the Zebulonite. He judges Israel for 10 years, and then he died. Nothing else mentioned about him. Uh, Abaddon. It says he had 40 sons, 30 grandsons. They rode on 70 donkeys. That's royalty. It's like saying they hey, drove 70 BMWs, okay? Everybody typically walked, not these guys. Uh, and tells us he judged Israel for eight years, and then he died. It tells us where these guys die, where they're buried. Uh, so three judges, we know where they're from. We know how long they judged. We know where they were buried. We know at least two of them had large families. Contrast that to Jephthah. We know little about his origin. We know little about his burial. His heritage has ended with him. Yet God writes twice as much about Jephthah. God sees things very differently than we think. On to chapter 13. To the record of Samson. He's the most well-known of the judges. Okay, uh, People who don't even know the Bible probably know who Samson was, right? <clears throat> he's like Hercules, right? Uh, he's remembered for what he does, not his spirituality. That's going to be significant as we move through the life of Samson. He stands apart from every other judge because he's the only one whose birth was prophesied. He's a Nazarite from the womb. We'll talk about that. And he has many lessons for us and specifically a couple of things I want you to note as we dive into the life of Samson because there's so much about him. Number one, his life teaches us what incredible power and authority without accountability leads to. His acts are always by himself. He never works with an army. He never works with a band of brothers. He, for all we know, he has no friends. This is Samson. Incredible strength, incredible power, incredible authority, no accountability. And second, the second thing I want you to know as we walk through the life of Samson, his life teaches us that consecration without communion always leads to tragedy. Okay? His mother takes a Nazarite vow before he's ever conceived. He has a Nazarite vow that is set upon him before he was conceived. Uh, here is a life set apart for the work of God, yet we never see him communing with God. The only time we see him praying is when he cries out for revenge on his enemies. He never builds an uh, a, 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 a altar. We never see him worshiping. We never see him communing or talking with God. His entire life. That doesn't mean that there isn't any relationship with God. We know next to nothing about his relationship with God. A man set apart before birth. He is a study in contrast, a man of great strengths, a man of great weakness, and he is a story of tragedy. Uh, he could have had an incredible legacy. It, it, when you finish reading the story of Samson, you are left lacking and saying, what could have been? What could have been? He will begin the delivery from the Philistines, their perennial enemies, Samuel and David, who, by the way, are on the scene about this time, 
Uh, if you put the timeline together, the story of Ruth happened about 100 years prior to Samson. That would have been uh, David's uh, grandma. Uh, Eli is the priest in Shiloh at this time, which means Samuel, who most scholars I read said that he was probably about, Samson was probably about 14 when Samson is dedicated at the temple. So all of this is happening behind the scenes. We, we read these stories, and, and by the way, uh, after Samson, it is not necessarily chronological, okay? I think that's important to remember. And so all these things, so he's going to start the delivery. Samuel and David are going to finish it. The delivery of Israel from the Philistines. Uh, we don't know what he looked like. We assume he looked probably like me, a professional bodybuilder. But, you know, the Philistines are always wondering. They're asking, what's the secret of your strength? For all we know, he could have had, been a nerd with glasses. The, the secret of his strength is that the Spirit of God came upon him. He didn't necessarily have to. Uh, I'm not saying he didn't. But the reality of his strength was the Spirit of the Lord. And yet somehow after all of this, he's still mentioned as one of the heroes of the faith in Hebrews chapter 11, that great cloud of witnesses. So there's something there still. All that intro, Samson chapter 13 verse 1 says, And the people of Israel did again what was evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Evil again in the sight of the Lord. This is the last time, by the way, that's going to be mentioned in the book of Judges, that they did evil again. God gives them into the hand of the Philistines. It's going to be for 40 years, it says. Uh, Philistine, it means uh, immigrant or wanderer. Uh, when Rome finally was tired of Israel and they defeated them, they, this, is, this is significant. This is fascinating on today that we're going to talk about this. Uh, uh, when Rome defeated Israel, Israel, they named the place Palestina, which is Latin. It means Philistine. It was the perennial enemy of Israel. It was an uh, insult to them. And Palestinia, if you know in modern English, is Palestine. That's where all this history is coming together. And, and, and the Philistines are different than the Canaanites, all right? They were not spread and divided throughout the land. These guys were organized. They had five cities, uh, uh, Ashdod, uh, Gath, Gaza, Ekron, and Eshkelon. If you look at a map right now, if you want to, I thought about throwing a map up, but if you want to know what this region looks like, just turn on your news. That's where this is happening. What is on the news right now is exactly where this is happening. If you look at Eshtal, which is a, a modern a Hebrew city, you can see the very place that is going to be mentioned where Manoah is living. And it's within 45 miles of Gaza. I mean, this is all in that region, okay? Uh, so five cities, they were wealthy. They were advanced in weapons and armor technology. Uh, Goliath's armor, which another fascinating thing. There are lots of scholars who believe Goliath was alive at this time too. He had to be because David's going to fight him when he's a little boy. So anyway, they... Goliath's armor is the most descri descriptive armor in all the Bible. These guys are wealthy, warlike people, advanced in, 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 in technology. They are the perennial enemies of Israel, and they are enemies even still to this day. Verse 2 tells us, There was a certain man of Zorah, of the tribe of the Danites, uh, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. This is the introduction for us of Samson's parents. Manoah, he is a Danite, and interesting enough, the word Dan means uh, to judge. Uh, he is going to have the son who is the last judge uh, in the book of Judges. Samuel will be the last judge overall. Uh, from Zorah, again, about, this is about 14 miles west of Jerusalem and about 45 miles north of Gaza. His mother, her name is wife. That's all we know about her as far as her name. We're never told her name. Uh, she is barren, which is a curse for an Israelite woman in that culture. Uh, it's just considered a sign that God's disfavor was upon a woman if she did not have children. They probably prayed for years for a child. You know, there, there are some scholars fascinating enough that believe that, that Hannah, 
heard this story and therefore started crying out to the Lord for Samuel. I don't know if that's true, but it's fascinating. Uh, it would make sense. Uh, they had probably prayed for years. For We're going to see that these are godly parents. Okay? Uh, verse two, uh, 3 tells us, An angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have uh, not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore, be careful and drink no wine or strong drink or nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. So here's what's going on. It tells us that the angel of the Lord appears to the woman. He says, you're barren and, and you have not had any children. You're going to have a son. She must have been shocked at that. We're going to see here that they just thought that this was an ordinary man of God, a prophet. Imagine that you are carrying some deep burden of brokenness that nobody really knows about. And somebody just walks up to you at random and says, I know your deep broken heartache. The Lord's going to end it. You're going to be a little surprised at that, that somebody would know your most intimate hurts and brokenness who you've never met before and he's going to come up to you and say the Lord is going to put an end to this you you would be surprised at that and it's going to explain some of her uh, actions here imagine that okay the, it's shocking the rest of the message that this angel of the Lord shares with her is about taking a Nazarite vow she would have known what a Nazarite vow was uh, it, it is a vow uh, that that uh, was a consecration of oneself to the Lord. If you want to read all about it, Numbers chapter 6 describes all about a Nazarite vow. Basically, don't drink strong drink, wine, eat anything unclean, and cut your hair. Uh, these are godly people living amongst ungodliness all around them. They knew God's word. They probably knew what a Nazarite vow was. Uh, she was to take the vow first to consecrate herself before he is ever born, so that he is consecrated even before conception through, and it tells us, to the end of his life. A Nazarite vow typically was only for a season. There was a limit to it. In Scripture, it mentions a Nazarite vow, but there was always a limit. Samson is unique because his was from before birth till his death. From Fascinating. Note what the text says. The angel tells her he shall begin, begin to deliver Israel from the Philistines. We mentioned this already. Samuel and David are going to finish it. Sometimes we just get to begin something and somebody else comes along and finishes it. And we should rejoice in that, that the Lord's work is done, whether we start it or finish it. Paul talks about it to the Corinthians. He says, why do you say I follow Peter or I follow Paul or Apollos? Some plant, some water. God causes the growth. God causes the increase. He's the one that should receive credit. Uh, this is all very similar, by the way, to John the Baptist, right? In Luke chapter 1, uh, 13 through 17, it's going to go through similar things. And what's fascinating is, remember, John is just going to Start the work. He's awakening the people to the one Redeemer who is going to be there. He says, I'm here to point to him. I must decrease because he's going to increase. John understood this. Samson's ultimate failure to fully deliver Israel, what is fascinating to me is his ultimate failure to finish the job God already knows. And God still chooses him. And God still blesses him. And God still continually puts his spirit upon him. What an incredible birth announcement, right? He's going to be consecrated to the Lord. He's got a calling. He's got a job before he's even born. He's got a purpose that God has set aside for him. It makes you wonder, had he not compromised what he would have accomplished? All by himself through the work of the Holy Spirit upon him. Verse 6 then continues, and it says, uh, if I can find it. Man, why 
I cannot see the six. It's really small. There it is. Then the woman came and told her husband. A man came and told her, uh, came to me. A man of God came to me, and his appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God. Very awesome. I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. But he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. So then uh, drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. So here's what's going on. She, she has this man come to her. He apparently leaves. She runs to her husband. I'm sure she would have ran very quickly. This is all exciting. Uh, she, she finds him. Uh, she says, thinking that this is a prophet, she says, a man of God. Uh, his appearance was like an angel. It was incredible. Uh, uh, she relays, she goes, you know, she relays the whole message. She's like, I was so stunned at all of it. I forgot to ask him where he was from or what his name was. And you can imagine Manoah at this. Really? Some random guy walks up to you, says all this, and you don't even ask who he is or where he's from? What, where, where did he get the authority of this? Verse 8 tells us that uh, <clears throat> Manoah then, this is an incredible response, prays to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, please let the man of God teach us what we are to do with the child who will be born. His response is he believes his wife and then he prays. This incredible response. Uh, and he says to him, listen, have the man of God come back so that we can know, give us the details for this child, what we should understand. This is, by the way, the prayer that every parent should make. We got uh, some, uh, thank you. This is what every parent should be praying, right? <clears throat> Lord, teach us what we should know about how to raise our children. This is an incredibly humble man seeking God's guidance and wisdom. Uh, verse 9 tells us that God listens and answers the prayer. God listened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again to the woman as she sat in the field. Uh, but Manoah, uh, her husband, was not with her. So the woman ran quickly. Do you think she probably said, really, again? Where is he? Uh, so the woman ran quickly and told her husband, Behold, the man came to me the other day. Uh, who came to me the other day has appeared to me. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. God listens. He answers the prayer. Uh, she's out in the field by herself. The angel of the Lord comes again to the woman. Uh, her husband's not there, so she runs. She's like, hey, just stay here. Don't leave. She runs, goes, grabs her husband, tells Manoah, hey, he's back. Uh, come quick, honey. Uh, let's go. Uh, and he gets there, and uh, he asks the, the angel of the Lord, are you the man that spoke to her before? And his response is very short. I am. Sound familiar? It's fascinating. I don't know that that's specific. I wonder if this is intentional. I am, which is what Jesus is going to answer in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's going to say, I am. It is, in, it is the very uh, thing that God says that, you know, when, when Moses is talking to him, he says, I am that I am. Uh, ego a me. Uh, you know, I don't know, but it is interesting. And we're going to touch on this angel of the Lord here in a moment. Uh, verse 12 tells us that uh, uh, Manoah then speaks to him. Now when your words come true, what is to be the child's manner of life and what is his mission? And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, uh, of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful, she may not eat. And he's going to repeat the Nazarite vow, uh, eat of nothing, anything that comes from the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink or eat anything unclean, all that I commanded her to observe. Let her observe. Manoah, you want to know why I think he's a godly man? Look at what his response is. He believes. He believes. He says, when this comes true, not if, but when. Contrast that to Zechariah, who when the angel comes to him and says, listen, your wife Sarah is barren, but she is going to conceive a child, a son. You shall, you know, that, that, that he's going to be the forerunner of Christ. What does Zechariah say? He says, how shall I know this is true? 
What sign will you give me to show me that this is true? Manoah, there is nothing like that. He says, when this happens, what are we supposed to do? Fascinating. That is incredible faith. When it happens, he says, what is his purpose? You know, what's his purpose? I want to know. You know, you've obviously been a messenger of God, probably because they realized that he had revealed to her something that nobody else probably knew, or at least that, that, her, that he would never have known. And he says, when this happens, what do, what do I do? What is the purpose? You know, you're putting it all together. They believe this child is prophesied, a special announcement to them. Uh, they know he's supposed to be consecrated. He must have a special purpose. So what is it? How are we supposed to raise him? What are the details? They obey in faith. They are godly parents. And, and here's another. There are, this text is chock full of application after application. Uh, Parents, let this be a lesson. Godly parents are no guarantee of godly lives in our children. I hate to say that, but that is a reality. In the end, they still must choose to follow Jesus, and it is their choice. It is essential that we lay before them a godly example, but it is still their choice. The angel repeats the instructions he had given to the woman, let her carefully obey. He's to be a Nazarite all his life, no alcohol, nothing unclean to to eat, no touching dead bodies, no razor to the head. It is interesting that Samson is going to violate almost every single one of those. Verse 15, Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, please let us detain you and prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, if you detain me, I will not eat your food, but if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know. Here's how we definitely know. Text tells us, for Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, what is your name? So that when your words come true, still believing, we may honor you. And the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? Let's pause there. Manoah says, hey, let's, let us show you some hospitality. It is part of our culture. Uh, they still think he is a man of God. And, and, and they definitely did not know he was the, the definite article is there, the angel of the Lord. You can highlight, underline the word, the angel of the Lord. And so the angel of the Lord responds, uh, you can do it, but I'm not going to eat it. I don't need food. But if you're going to do a burnt offering... Just to affirm who he is, he says, don't offer it, offer it to the Lord. If you want to do an offering, you need to offer it to God. Uh, Manoah is still thinking he's just a man. He says, what's your name? And the, you know, he's like, where are you from? I, you know, we want to thank you when all of this comes to fruition. We want to give you credit. We, we, you know, we want to recognize you, follow up, let you know how he's doing. The angel asked him, uh, why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? The word wonderful there means incomprehensible. It is the exact same word that is used in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, when it tells us that his name shall be wonderful, counselor, mighty God. They wanted answers, and sometimes when we want answers from God, he doesn't always reveal the answers to us because they are beyond us, incomprehensible. Jesus says that there are many things that he wanted to reveal to his disciples, but it wasn't time. They couldn't understand. They couldn't comprehend it. Sometimes we want answers from God, and he doesn't reveal it to us because he just wants us to trust and obey him in faith. Trust and obey him in faith. Verse 19 then says, and we are scooting along, good. So Maniah took the young goat with the grain offering, and offered it on the rock to the Lord, to the one who works wonders. And Manoah and his wife were watching. And when the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord went up in the flame of the altar. Now Manoah and his wife were watching, and they fell on their faces to the ground. <clears throat> so they, they go and prepare the offering. Uh, they, they begin to offer the goat and, and a grain offering on this rock. Uh, and they, it says, to the Lord... Who works wonders. Again, same word. And you say, what are the wonders that it's talking about? Well, as they're watching, as they've 
fired up the flames as they're watching. Can you imagine this? This guy that you think is a guy walks into the flames and just poof, vanishes off into heaven. I think I would probably respond very similar to what Manoah and his wife are going to do here. They fall on their faces. Can you imagine that if you're witnessing it, if you're a part of that? You, you know, you're, you're thinking that you're going to honor this man. You're going to honor the Lord uh, for this man. And all of a sudden, the man walks into the fire. He goes up into heaven. I would probably think, oh, wow, that is wondrous. Incomprehensible. The text tells us then in verse 21, the angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. Thought process changed. And Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die for we have seen God. But his wife said to him, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering at our hand or show us all these things or now announce to us such things as these. This is the last appearance of the angel of the Lord in the book of Judges. Manoah at this has an epiphany. He's like, oh, wow. That wasn't just a man. That was the angel of the Lord. That was God. And it tells us that, that you know, when he sees that, uh, for an Old Testament believer, the angel of the Lord meant God in the flesh manifested before them. And they are suddenly terrified. He is terrified, I should say. And, and at that, uh, uh, you know, by the way, the, it, it, for those of you who like theological terms, this is what we call a uh, theophany, uh, uh, Old Testament appearance of Jesus. Uh, it's happened several times uh, before this. Uh, Joshua has the captain of the Lord's army. That is the angel of the Lord. It's a theophany. It's Jesus in the flesh uh, before his uh, uh, birth. Uh, and then you have him appearing to Gideon as well. Lots of different examples. Uh, so Manoah turns to his wife and he says, we are dead. Godly men, godly man, remember, he knows the word. He probably is thinking back to Exodus 33 where Moses says, I want to see your face. And God says, if you see my face, you shall surely die. So he says, knowing the word, we have seen God's face. We're going to die. That's the result. There is no hope for us. It is clear that Manoah now thought he was not just a man of God, but he was God. His wife, incredible response, incredible reply. She doesn't criticize her husband, you idiot. <laughs> Listen, if he wanted to wipe us out, he wouldn't have accepted the offering. If he wanted to wipe us out, he wouldn't have told us that we were going to have a son. And he was going to begin to... Uh, deliver Israel from the Philistines. Why would he have told us about having a kid if he wanted to kill us? Listen, when you are living in fear that the Lord is punishing you, that he is out to get you, you need to ask yourself, if that were the case, why would he have ever accepted the sacrifice of Jesus Christ? Right? Right? His love is our confidence. John writes about it. He says, listen, so we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this love, uh, by this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. Listen, the love of God shows us if you have come to Christ in a relationship through the saving work of the finished work on the cross, God's not punishing you. His punishment for you has been dealt with in Jesus. Now, that doesn't mean that he won't discipline you. And he's disciplining, you know, we're told in Hebrews chapter, uh, what, 13 or 12, 13, I think, where he says, listen, God's going to discipline you as a father disciplines his children because he wants you to come back to him. That doesn't mean he's punishing you. So she's saying to her husband, which, by the way, you will never strengthen anyone's faith by criticizing them. You remind them of the truth. That's what she does. She reminds him, points back to the truth. Listen, he wouldn't have told us. 
He wouldn't have accepted the sacrifice. Imagine how this, all of this impacted their raising of uh, Samson, right? How many times when Samson was like, I want to cut my hair, they would say, no, no, no. God visited us before you were born and told us this. I mean, he probably got sick of hearing that. Yeah, yeah, I know. God visited you. It was a, you know, I'm sure it impacted him. Incredible ways. We'll finish off the chapter here. Verse 24, it tells us, uh, And the woman bore a son and called his name Samson. And the young man grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him in Mahane Dan, uh, between Zorah and Eshtol. Nine months between verses 23 and 24, uh, from birth to, to adulthood, uh, in verse 24 to 25, this is a fast childhood. You know, when they talk about, you know, you close your eyes and they grow up and they're all, you know, this is like one verse and he's already an adult. She has a son, it tells us, names him Samson. He grows up and the Lord blesses him. Filled with all kinds of advantages, right? From before birth, he's consecrated. He's raised by godly parents. He's blessed by the Lord. We're going to see over and over again that the Holy Spirit comes upon him. Still, his life is filled with mistakes and tragedy. Samson, despite all of his advantages, despite all of them, he makes his own choices. Text tells us here that the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him. And the, the, the original language there literally means the Holy Spirit began to beat on him. So where he's living, if you were to look at a topographical map of Israel, you'd see that he lives on, on like a, a hilltop and it overlooks uh, these Philistine uh, villages, or not Philistine villages, but the, 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 the plain before him where all the Philistines are. And, and again, so fascinating. This is exactly the place that you see on the maps today and the news. It's exactly where this is all taking place. Gaza is the city of Gaza. Ashkelon is one of the cities of the Philistines. You can see it right now if you were to pull up a map. Eshtol is right there. All these things are not just fun stories. They're factual. Factual. You know, people have been asking me, are you disappointed you might not get to go to Israel in a month? And I said, listen, I'd rather go see the New Jerusalem. So if that's what's going on, I'm excited about that. Uh, but, but listen, there, the, you can take what is going on today and you need to understand that what God is doing, He is doing and He is going to return, whether it's 100 years from now or whether it's tomorrow. And we need to understand that it is being unfolded before our very eyes and that time is short. And that means we should be doing something about it. We should be proclaiming the truth of God. We should not become like Samson who has every advantage, born into the family of God with the Holy Spirit residing in you and wasted away. And by the way, uh, without getting any political here, so oftentimes the, 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 the church thinks it has to be either Israel or Palestine. Listen, there are unbelievers all over. And they all need to come to Jesus. And it's not an issue of which side are we for. It's not an and uh, either or. It is we are on the Lord's side and we want to see God do a work in people's hearts. And Israel needs to be eyes open to the fact that their Messiah has come and has lived and has died for them. And those who are, even Hamas, who are going and attacking people, they need to know that Jesus died for them and need to be reminded of the truth. Samson is looking over the plain and seeing his people mistreated, being abused, being murdered, being uh, robbed. On a constant basis, God has put him on a vantage point, and he has put you on a vantage point to see the world that is 
filled with sin and wickedness. We are no different than the book of Judges where we can read over and over again, there is no king in Israel. So everyone did that which is right in their own eyes. And God is beating upon you with his Holy Spirit to convict you and put a burden on you to share the gospel and the truth with people who are dying and going to hell. And that is a reality. That when we see Samson, we see that God is working on him and saying, listen, there is a need, a great need. People always ask me, how do I know what my calling in life is? I'll tell you what a calling is. A calling is seeing a need and going and meeting it. People come up to me and say, there is this lack in the church that needs to happen. You know what my response is? God put that on your heart, maybe because he wants you to do something about it. You say, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life. I don't know what God is calling me to do. Whatever burden he is placing upon your heart, and he has lifted you up in a place where you can see the vantage point of those around you who need Jesus and are dying. And he says, this is the call. The Holy Spirit is beating upon you a burden to share the truth. And unfortunately for this text, the next verse in verse uh, chapter 14 is very prophetic in how it starts. Samson went down. Samson's going to be the last judge in the book of Judges. And after him, I said before, it is, is just stories that are going to illustrate the conditions of the times. And there are some interesting things. I, I, I'm not envious of Mike, who's going to be teaching later on to finish the book of Judges. Some really fascinating stories that you should read ahead and um, uh, prepare yourself for. What do we do with all this? Samson shows us that there is no human worthy of to be a redeemer. People put pastors or, or uh, theological leaders up on a pedestal, and guess what happens? They fall. They crumble down because they're sinful, just like you and me. There is no human. Samson has all the strength of, of, of the Spirit of the Lord upon him, the strongest man in human history, unable to deliver his people. We're going to see later on that Solomon has all the wisdom of the world, unable to make a change in Israel. And the question we should ask as we dive through all that, if you don't know Jesus, you need to be asking as we hear about this, the strongest man in the world could not free his people. The smartest man in the world could not bring freedom. Who then shall deliver us? Paul talks about it in Romans. He says, listen, I have a struggle within my own soul that I, don't, I know what is right and I do what is wrong and there's a constant reminder of God's law that this is a violation of what he has laid before me to say that I am to be perfect and holy just as he is holy and every day I know that I'm fighting internally, that there is no hope in me. And he concludes and he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of sin? He's going to later on, he's going to say, thanks be to God for Jesus Christ who has delivered me. And brothers and sisters, if you don't know Jesus, there is no hope and you should be asking yourself, who will deliver me? As not a person, there is no one worthy except Jesus. We already heard that as Ben read our call to worship, that, that when the, the call went out, and that's what's going to happen in the book of Revelation, says there's a call that goes out. Uh, who is worthy to open the scrolls? And, and, and the, the writer John starts weeping. He says, there is no one worthy. And the elder, the angel there says, why do you weep? For the Lion of Judah is here. He alone is worthy. And if you don't know Jesus, listen to me. He has come because you needed him. If you look at your life for just a moment, you recognize that there is nothing worthy in you. And the reality is that the Bible tells us very plainly that the soul that sins, the wages of sin, all of this, when we violate God's word in any way, the Bible tells us that if you violate in one aspect, you're guilty of breaking all of it. And we see this and the punishment is death, eternal condemnation. And the beauty of the gospel, which is just simply this, is good news, uh, that there is no judge worthy, there's no human savior worthy, only Jesus. And Jesus has come and he is laid himself in your place, received the punishment that you deserved. And, and what makes the gospel so amazing is that you get what he deserves and he got what you deserve. 
And the Bible tells us that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What about the rest of us? If you have a relationship with Jesus, here's what I would challenge you with as the worship team comes up. Parents, you should be praying, God, what am I to do to raise my children? And don't expect that your example is enough. The only way, just like the only way we can be redeemed, the only way that you can raise your children properly is that you can't, but the Holy Spirit working in them can. We rely on Jesus Christ and His work. You have been given every advantages. And you can have all the advantages and still not walk in fellowship with the Lord. God has blessed you. Peter writes, he has given you everything you need for a life of righteousness and godliness. And he has put you on a hillside to view out those who are in desperate need to be redeemed. And he challenges you and his Holy Spirit burdens you. And if you don't have that burden, you need to first of all consider... Has the burden been that I need Jesus? You say, well, Pastor Nate, how can you question my salvation? I'm not questioning your salvation. I'm asking you, if you don't have a burden for the lost, then you don't understand the saving grace that has redeemed you from your death. And that should provoke you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you that you are a God who needs no man to redeem. We thank you that Jesus Christ is our eternal redeemer, and we do not want to practice religion, but we want a relationship with you. Lord, would you speak into our hearts? Father, I pray that if there is anyone here that does not know you, that today they would consider, that they would consider their place, their position, that they are outside. And one day they will be cast into outer darkness unless they come to you and receive an eternal gift paid for by the blood of Jesus. And Father, for, for those who know you, I pray that we would have a burden placed upon our hearts to see the lost come to know you, to share the gospel. Father, you have made us ambassadors. You've given us a call to reconcile the world through the message of the gospel. And Lord, I pray that we would go out with that heart, that we would serve and seek you. We thank you. We praise you. We pray this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen.